Um, I forgot this, and I'm just going to add this in at the beginning. Uh, this is in regards to conventional deadlift. I do not have enough experience in sumo deadlifts to make a video about it. Uh, so just assume everything I'm talking about here is in regards to conventional deadlift. What's up, guys? So I've been asked this question a lot, um, and I decided in lieu of just answering it um, repeatedly in comment sections and on threads just to go ahead and make a video about it. So deadlifting with uh, T-Rex leverages, basically. So me, I've, I've got a pretty long torso and uh, short arms, so deadlifting isn't my most mechanically advantageous lift, uh, to say the least. And I've managed to deadlift 700, uh, 705 with straps, 700 on the platform uh, with, you know, my T-Rex arms and my sausage fingers and giant palms that makes gripping a nightmare. Um, I, like, I physically can't even hook grip. Uh, so anyway, so I've been asked to make this video. And what I want to say, I guess, is is you're going to kind of, it, it's, a three-headed monster almost like you're gonna have to practice your deadlifts obviously um, you know specificity is specificity is specificity that's going to be your most important thing however with deadlifts and with a build like us they can be extremely taxing and hard to recover from so sometimes it's best to break it down a little bit and this is not that you're going to completely shy away from your uh just you know regular deadlifts and practicing the movement itself but at sometimes you're going to have to prioritize uh other variations that can be you know still close to your regular deadlift and the two biggest issues if you are a t-rex in deadlifting uh number one is going to be positioning and number two is going to be a sufficient amount of volume to get stronger but still being able to recover from and there's two variations that stick out to me that are head and shoulders above the rest that help with both of these issues we'll start with positioning for positioning uh pause deadlifts and this is a pause right off the floor like as soon as the weights break the floor pause and as you're farther away from competition, I want you to hold the pause a little bit longer. So maybe you're, you know, you're way, way, there's not even a competition in mind right now. You're just practicing, working on positioning. All right, you know, barely break the floor. And if I were programming a lifter, I would say do a five count pause. And I'm really looking for a three count pause. Uh, most everybody lies to themselves when they're counting. Uh, the time feels like it goes a lot slower when you're actually holding the weight in your hand. And inevitably, you're going to count fast. So you, I'm wanting a three-count pause. And again, if I was coaching somebody or programming somebody, I would program a five-count pause because that's probably going to be closer to a three-count pause. And then if they actually did five-count pauses, you know, we would readjust for the next week. Um, and I would, you know, say, oh, you're not lying to yourself. Go ahead and do a three. But anyway, pause that. As soon as you break the floor, that is going to hammer, hammer, hammer that position um, and get you strong as fuck from that position because we don't want to be extremely reliant on floor speed because what happens there is you will end up sacrificing position um, because you feel like the bar is coming faster off the floor and you'll be looking for that momentum uh, off the floor to carry you through lockout rather than being in an advantageous position to ensure lockout and it becomes a hit or miss thing. You'll see a lot of guys you know, explode off the floor with their deadlifts and then, you know, come two or three inches shy of lockout and just absolutely hit a wall. They can't get their glutes through. They can't get their shoulders back. And that's because they're, they sacrificed position um, from the beginning for floor speed, thinking that that was the way. And and when you're, when you're doing sub-maximal reps, it really, it feels better and it will trick you into thinking you're stronger as such, but it, it's just that it's a trick. Um, you're better off sacrificing a little bit of floor speed for having better position. And while the bar won't absolutely fly to lockout like it does prior, um, it will be a much smoother and controlled pull. And when it comes past your knees, um, you know, you're going to lock it out every time. So 
you really want to work on positioning. Um, and one of the best drills I've found for staying in good positions is doing pause deadlifts again with the pause right when the plates break the floor. And this is something, like I said, far farther out, you're going to want to do longer pauses, um, hold them for a good three count. Uh, and then as you work your way, getting towards more meat specific, or you're going to get done with a training cycle and move on, uh, you can certainly, you know, increase the weight. And I would recommend these, you know, when you're getting to that point, uh, be at heavier percentages and maybe doing, you know, like triples with them, like three sets of three or something like that. Um, and when, when you're getting up to, you know, 90%, something like that, you, you can drop that pause to a one count or just a, if, if you're a really advanced lifter and you know yourself well, just a brief pause uh, as soon as you break the floor, show that position and then, you know, explode from there. And th this is going to inevitably increase your floor speed, bleh, floor speed as well, just by virtue of doing these. When you get heavy and you're stopping and pausing right off the floor and then going, uh, when you go back to just, you know, your regular deadlift, uh, it's going to feel so much faster off the floor just by virtue of having done these. You're going to be in much better position. Your lockout's going to be better. The, it, it's just an overall, it's a great movement for positioning and will help your deadlift uh, tenfold. So the second problem we come into with, uh, you know, being built like us and deadlifts is recoverable volume. Being able to do enough volume to elicit gains um, and get stronger uh, while still being able to recover our, you know, when we get in position for deadlifts on the floor, you know, our back is damn near parallel to the floor when we're starting and, uh, our, our joints aren't quite as open, you know, our knees are much more, uh, folded to the ground, uh, not starting with that open joint angle, like some of these orangutan built fellas. Uh, and it, it causes a lot of stress on us to deadlift off the floor. So, but we still want to get volume in, but you know, it's hard to recover from that. And especially you've got other lifts going on. You have to take that into account too. Uh, this is where block pulls and wagon wheels come in. I'm generally not too big a fan of reduced range of motion work. However, again, th this is a way for us to get volume. And th this is something the block pulls I don't do as a main movement on a day. This is something I would put in you know, say you're going to do deadlifts and you're going to work up to a, a top triple and maybe one back offset, or maybe you remove all your back offsets. Your warm ups are enough. You work up to a top triple, you know, 85 to 90%, something pretty heavy. Uh, to do your, your volume work uh, and get in volume after that, you can go to block pulls or wagon wheels. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a super heavy weight either. Um, you can practice and there's, some benefits overload. I'm not really a big fan of overloading um, and things like that. I'm honestly, I still feel better like pulling off the floor than I do pulling from blocks as far as if I'm going to do something heavy. Um, but you're going to want this for volume uh, and you train it like you would your compound lifts. You know, your bread and butter is going to be, you know, 70 to 90% range. Um, Obviously, you know, starting around 70% somewhere in there and doing higher volume. And if you want to build it up and then kind of taper it and, you know, work towards doing some fives and then threes, you know, up in the upper 80% and getting there and getting strong at the movement. But I, I really just use it for volume and that 70 to 80% range is kind of where I stay at. Uh, and it, it allows you to get in that volume building some very similar muscles obviously the neural patterns are a little bit different because you're not pulling from the floor but you're still pulling from the floor you're just doing that in conjunction with these um and it's it's going to allow you to do a lot more volume than you could otherwise and be able to recover from it because you are starting in a bit better position you're still not starting in you know such an advantageous position like there's still going to be deadlift specialists who their deadlift off the floor is going to be a more advantageous position than your deadlift off of blocks or wagon wheels. Um, I use the wagon wheels because we have them. 
Um, and it's a lot easier to set up than blocks. But if you're going to do block pulls, make sure the bar is, you know, below your knees. That's not something you want to start above your knees. You want them to be below your knees. Um, and th this is to build as much muscle as possible, get in good quality volume, be able to recover from it. This is not something to ego lift, stroke your ego uh, above the knee, like maximum overload. Look at me, I can pull a thousand pounds for one inch. Uh, th this is not what that is. This is to build muscle, to get in volume, and allow yourself to be able to recover from it because I, I can't, I can't physically do the kind of volume that I would like to do with traditional deadlifts. Um, for me, actually, you know, I got a little bit of power belly, obviously my arms are short, so I, I'm getting into not a great position when I'm down there deadlifting. And a lot of times too, what happens is, you know, just simply going all the way down for the deadlift and coming back up, you're pushing air out of yourself every time you go down there and you know if the weights are submaximal enough you're going to run out of breath before muscular failure um and you want to get you know close to muscular failure uh you know one or two left in the tank and running out of air before that happens is detrimental to growth so that's, a, that's another thing aside from the the fatigue management in itself from being in a more advantageous position, uh, you're not going to, you're not going down as far. You're not pressing on your diaphragm quite as much, and it's going to allow you to breathe more efficiently. Um, and that way, you know, as you're doing these volume phases to elicit growth, you're going to be able to come closer to muscular failure, um, and not run out of breath, uh, which, you know, is defeating the purpose. We're not doing this, uh, for cardio and breathing purposes. We're doing it to fucking build muscle. So yeah, one, one bonus thing I'm going to throw in here at the end. Uh, if you've watched Alex, Alexander, Alex Bromley's video, uh, about, uh, uh power lifters versus strong men, who's the better deadlifter. Um, I will say, Taking some cues from our strongman brothers is probably a good thing. Using straps from time to time um, is not going to be detrimental. You should be doing enough pulls in your uh, accessory work, uh, be it rows uh, with cables, if you do rows with a barbell, um, gripping dumbbells, etc., etc. You should be getting enough grip work in. And I'm not saying do all of your deadlifts with straps, but certainly... Uh, if they allow you to get some more volume in, if your grip is failing before your, your, the muscles you're trying to hit are failing, definitely throw in some straps there. Um, don't be afraid to use axles from time to time, deadlifting from different heights. Again, I do not recommend going anywhere above your knees. Uh, there's just, it, it's not going to have any significant carryover. Um, but don't, don't be afraid to experiment with some, uh, some of our strongmen friends and what they do in regards to the deadlift, uh, it, it's only going to be beneficial to you. Uh, just again, don't leave your bread and butter altogether, which is, you know, the, the deadlift from the floor and, uh, uh, bonus number two, I guess in regards to, uh, grip as well, uh, your sodium intake and your diet, uh, a, a lot of, especially the bigger guys, when you get them 275s and ups, our hands get puffy in addition to already being, you know, really thick and midi and stubby fingers, it makes gripping the bar not so great. And when your hands are puffy um, and bloated, it makes it even worse. And you'll see a lot of grip fails from bigger guys um, in competition. And this is a lot of why uh, you're seeing some of these deadlift specialists now, uh, you know, are smaller. Of course, there's the sumo technique as well. There's hook grip and stuff. But, uh, you know, these bigger guys, if you threw straps on a lot of them, their deadlift would be a hundred pounds higher, if not more. Um, again, this is not one-to-one -one for everybody, but there's a lot of guys that get a lot of weight out of straps. Even some of these hook grip deadlift specialists are getting a lot out of straps. Uh, so j just be leery of that. I know when I do a meet, it's like, I want to be nice and bloated for squats and bench. And then I'm fingers crossed, hoping that I've sweated enough out <laughs> throughout the meet while still rehydrating some, uh, that I lose some of that puffiness 
so my hands aren't super bloated coming to the deadlift and I've, I've been hit or miss there. So yeah. Anyway, uh, peace.